Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm the host, Robert Bryce. On this show, this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome my uh, guest, Bjorn Lomborg, uh, the president of the Copenhagen Consensus Center. Uh, Dr. Lomborg, welcome. Hey, Robert. It's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, today, we're going to talk about your new book, False Alarm, How Climate Change Panic Costs Us Trillions, Hurts the Poor, and Fails to Fix the Planet. Um, what I do on my podcast is I like, you know, you have a long resume and a PhD and do lots of things, have lots of, uh, of credentials. I like to let our guests introduce themselves. So if you don't mind, I'm putting you on the spot. Um, uh, if you sure. just arrived somewhere and you need to introduce yourself, you don't know anyone at the party at the dinner table, uh, if you don't mind, who are you? Oh, God, I probably make it very quick and then ask people to ask me questions. Uh, but given that, that you're asking me for a slightly longer version, let me just give you sort of the two minute version. Uh, so uh, I'm a political scientist. Uh, I used to believe that yeah, I was an academic. I thought I was just going to be doing really odd stuff, uh, game theory uh, and social sciences, that kind of thing. Uh, and I, I was also, uh, you know, a, a vegetarian, a member of Greenpeace, not out in the rubber boat or anything, but, you know, just the average uh, uh, middle class worried about the environment and everything. Uh, and I read back in 1997 uh, uh, an interview with the American uh, economist uh, Julian Simon, who said, you think everything is getting worse, but that's actually not true. And, and I thought, oh, you know, right-wing American propaganda. But he did say one thing that really bothered me, and that was what I was teaching my, my students in statistics. He said, go check the data. And so I did that. And it turns out that a lot of what he said was right. Not all of it. And, you know, there's also some wishful thinking and stuff. But fundamentally, a lot of the stuff that you believe you know is not necessarily true. And that was why I wrote uh, my first book called, uh, the, in English called The Skeptical Environmentalist. And since then, you know, I've, I've continued for at least 10 years to believe that I was gonna get back to actually doing my, my research on game theory and, 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 uh, and social sciences. Uh, but I've basically been stuck in this position instead of talking about, so look, we have lots and lots of myths and misunderstandings about how the world works. What is the actual correct information? And if we have that correct information, how can we best make decisions? Because there's not enough money. So let's make sure we actually spend the money where it helps the most, both when you want to do something about the environment or if you want to do something about climate change, or indeed, if you just want to make good in the world. So that's really what I do with the Copenhagen Consensus, my think tank, uh, and what I try to talk to everyone about. And that's why I'm excited that we're going to be talking about that for a little hour here. Sure. Great. So the book is, is False Alarm. It came out in July. Um, and we're told, I mean, you're, you're going at one of the, um, the, the issues now that is the most divisive uh, politically. Um, and one that uh, the, the alarm about climate and climate change is repeated all the time. Uh, Joe Biden here in, in the United States on the campaign trail said climate change is, is an existential threat. In your book, you wrote, people are terrified of climate change above all else. Half the world's surveyed population believes human extinction is likely and that faced with possible annihilation, any expenditure is justified. You're arguing against that mindset. So why are so many people convinced that we're doomed? So I, I think <laughs> I think there's partly a, a psychological fact to this. You know, if you look back in time, it's not like this is the first time we thought we we're all going to be doomed. Uh, so, you know, back in the 1970s, we thought we we're all going to run out of food and large portions of the world would not be able to survive and probably would be uh, diminished uh, dramatically or we'd run out of, you know, resources, the whole limit to growth thing. And, and you know, Time magazine was uh, famously predicting that a few million people in California would be surviving and, and you know, growing uh, uh, their organic food in, the, in the, uh, the median of the highways that were left over in Los Angeles, that kind of thing. You know, the, and, the and before that, when, and before that, when I was a kid, it was it was nuclear annihilation, right? The, yes, the, the, although the, although we were, nuclear we're... annihilation in some ways was a little more, you know, that could actually happen because, uh, you know, it's it's not like the world is trying to get rid of us, but nuclear weapons are actually by people who might actually want you to go extinct. So there's at least it's a little more worrisome. But I think I think the fundamental 
the point is we've always had this sense, uh, you know, uh, acid rain in the 1980s. It was very big in the U.S. It was incredibly large in, in Germany. And, and the belief was literally a majority of Germans believed that all the forests were going to be gone by the year 2000. You know, needless to say, there were more forests in 2000 than there were in, in the 1980s when they worried about this. But the, but the fundamental point here is we always hear this and we always worry. And it's a great way to both get clicks or reads and to get uh, policy action. So, you know, if you, if you talk to your teachers, will they tell you that everything is fine? You don't need to spend more money on schools? Of course they won't. They'll tell you that, you know, pupils are not learning very much and you need to spend much more on education, likewise in healthcare, likewise in every other thing. There's no problem with that happening. That's what single issue organizations will tell you. The problem is, if we believe that they're the only representatives of telling us the truth, if we believe that it's the end of the world, then obviously we're willing to spend quite a bit on fixing that problem. But the reality is, and that's what I'm trying to say, that's one of the two bits I really try to do with my book, is if you actually look at what the UN climate panel, so I think that's the gold standard of what we know about climate change, they tell us global warming is real, it's a problem, it's a reasonable, manageable problem. They tell us by the 2075, say 2070s, it will be equivalent to each one of us losing income equivalent to 0.2 to 2%. So, you know, at worst, global warming in 2075 is going to be equal to you feeling 2% less well off. Remember, by then, the UN estimate that we'll each be about 362% as rich as what we are today. I have to use all those digits because otherwise I can't actually show the impact of the 2%. So what really means global warming means instead of us being 362% as rich in 2075, we will only feel like we're 356% as rich. Now that's a problem and it's certainly a problem we should talk about, but it's a very different mindset than the end is coming. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the IPCC quote there because that was one of the things that jumped out and it's something that I had not seen before until I, I read your book and I'm, I'm going to quote it here. You, you cite the IPCC and in 2014 said, quoting here, for most economic sectors, the impact of climate change will be small relative to the impacts of other drivers, changes in population, age, income, technology, relative prices, lifestyle, regulation, governance, and many other aspects of socioeconomic development. So amidst all the claims of, well, we have the science and the IPCC, why, why is that line not known to the general public? I, I think it's because there is also obviously a lot of interest in playing up global warming. Now, first, if you're media. And is, and is, that, and is what, that economic interest? Because that's one of the other things that well, I'm, who's, I'm who's sure stands, there's, who's, no. who stands to profit by the cataclysm, right? Or the threat yeah, of the yeah. prospect of cataclysm. Yes. So I, 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 I'll, I'll get a little bit into that. But I think, you know, if you look at media, obviously, they sell bad news. Uh, you don't hear, oh, there was no big problem yesterday. That's just not a news, right? That's not right. a news story. It is that there is a problem. Uh, you know, famously, over the last 25 years, we've lifted, you know, close to a billion people out of poverty. That's an amazing achievement. So every Every day for the last 25 years, we have lifted 130,000 people out of poverty. Every day that could have been the headline in every paper around the world. Yesterday, we lifted 130,000 people out of poverty. Yet it has literally never been the headline of any paper anywhere in the last 25 years. And, and one of the big problems, of course, is newspaper is not very good at delivering these long-term messages because it's not something that happened yesterday. It's something that happened over the last 25 years. So we don't hear much of the good news, but we do hear all the bad news because that's what people click on. There's this wonderful study. Uh, there's many studies, but you give people a pile of good news and a pile of bad news, and you ask them, uh, which one would you prefer to read? And many people actually say they'd like to read the good news. But when you then actually give them the pile, they'll read the bad news because, you know, huh. we're human. And right. we like that. It's much more fun. That's what we click on. That's what media will give us. Likewise, most politicians live off of being able to get you to vote for them. The strongest thing you could say is, you are going to die. Everyone you love is going to die. But if you vote for me, I can make that go away. And we've had that for you know, centuries. That used to be wars and you know, despair and all kinds of other stuff. Global warming is a wonderful opportunity to do just the same thing. It doesn't mean 
that these people are evil or, you know, of, or, or trying to manipulate. It's just an incredibly easy way to get people to vote for you, to say, here's a terrible problem. I promise to solve it. And of course, both of these are very tenuous claims. No, it's not the end of the world. It's a problem. And quite honestly, almost nothing you can do will make much of a difference, certainly in your lifetime. Now, this doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything. We should certainly do smart stuff, but we need to get a sense both of what's the size of the problem, you know, 0 0.2 to 2% more realistically, maybe 4% by the end of the century, let's just say, and how much can we do? Well, we can do some things, and I'm sure we'll get back to talking about those, but sure. we can also spend an enormous amount of money on doing almost nothing. And that's what I'm trying to get us to not do. Right. Well, and I'll come back to the, 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 the first con convening, I guess, of the Copenhagen consensus. It was in 2004, right? And again, in 2008, yeah. in which you force ranked all these different issues, all the different challenges that the world faces, which I thought was really clever and, and, and simple way to, 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 to look at the challenges because there are a lot. And I, um, but I think, you know, just to summarize what you just said about politicians, what's that old line about no politician ever got elected by saying everything's going to be just fine. Right. That, that, that we're, we're facing cataclysm if the, you elect the other guy because he's terrible and I'm going to save you from. So, but, but this idea, I want to go back to this idea of existential threat, because particularly now amid the pandemic. And I asked this question of Judith Curry, who I had on uh, uh, the podcast a, a few weeks ago we hear about existential threat and climate change. And now we're living through a pandemic, which has caused a global recession, uh, a million, over a million dead. Uh, were we focused on the wrong threat? Yeah. So, so I think we are vastly exaggerating any kind of existential threat. So there's actually, you know, some and any kind uh, of existential researchers. threat from, from climate change. But, but also from other things, you know, meteors and all these other things. So there are people who actually do this for a living uh, uh, based out of Oxford University. Uh, and, and they actually, they, they find that the, you know, the chances that we're going to go extinct from uh, global warming and nuclear war and all these other things are very, very small. Uh, the only thing that they really worry about, I have no idea, you know, this is a very imprecise science, is uh, Elon Musk's uh, AI, you know, the idea that we eventually get computers that decide, do we really need those humans? I don't know whether that's true, uh, but but yeah, I can see a scenario where that might be true. Uh, but but the fundamental point is even this you know this pandemic and a much much worse pandemic. Remember, you know, COVID nineteen is not terribly bad. You know, it could have been a lot worse, and it could have been you know killing literally you know hundreds of millions of people. Uh, but we still wouldn't die out. So the existential threat bit is probably exaggerated. And, and I also think there is something terrible about this existential idea because it makes you say we should spend all of our resources in this particular area and forget everything else. Uh, Nordhaus. So, uh, so, so who, that any, we'll, right, and you're, to interrupt you, but that's one of the points you make, and it's been something you've been really been talking about for 20 years, is what we have a limited amount of money, right? And yeah. we can't just print it forever. And that that, I think, is the key... I mean, of all the points in your book, I, I think that that's the one that you, you've reinforced that you've been talking about this for a long time, I think making some of the same arguments. But, but I think especially after COVID with all the money that the governments have been spending in order to avert recession or, or further or greater recession, that coming out of this, just exactly how much money is going to be available for these kind for, for the issue of climate change. And that's the one that I think is a big one here in the United States in particular. Oh God, yes, and, and look, we just don't have enough resources to fix all problems. And so we've always done this. We've said, look, there are lots of problems. We have limited resources, let's spend them smartly. And that means you never spend on anything fixing it totally. Uh, Nordhaus, whom we're gonna talk about later, he got the Nobel Prize. He's the will, only will, guy who gets will, the Nobel William, Prize will, on William, climate will, economics. Right, William Nordhaus. The, the climate William will, Nordhaus. Yeah. But he's done a lot of other interesting research and he's also been involved in these conversations for a very long time. He's a wonderful guy to read. Um, he once pointed out in a very long debate about these existential threats. Uh, he said, well, we actually have a really, really good example because the late 1990s, uh, the U.S. started realizing and NASA started realizing there's these big chunks of rock hurling around in, in the universe. And if one of them hits Earth and it's really big, that could be literally game over. 
so maybe we should start tracking those, uh, which is a smart idea. We know, you know, one hits every 100 million years. So it's not very likely, but it's not, you know, terribly, terribly unlikely. And do you really want to gamble on this? Anyway, so they came up with a budget proposal to find 90% of these space rocks. And then they also gave us an option to find 99% of them. But that obviously cost, you know, a significant number of billion dollars more. Sure. And the U.S. government said, you know what, we'll find 90, but not 99. And that's exactly how you deal with existential threat. You say, look, we're going to be reasonably safe, but we're not going to, you know, uh, uh, dot all the uh, I's and cross all the T's because we can't afford that. If we sure. were to do this everywhere, we wouldn't have enough money to do everything. That's why you need the same sort of approach to think about how do we tackle climate change in a smart way, but not in a way that means we end up spending so much money that we forget everything else. As, as I'm sure you've also uh, uh, seen, uh, the World Health Organization uh, for at least uh, you know, five years or so have been very worried about global warming, which is in health terms, a very small bit. I mean, it's not a trivial bit, but it's a fairly small bit compared to most other problems. Sure. And certainly you could make the argument that the World Health Organization being very concerned about climate change must all of the things equal have taken some of their attention away from pandemics, which probably and reasonably would have been more sort of their core thing that they should have been worried about. Right. Um, you talk about uh, your book is fundamentally a positive outlook. Um, you say climate change will have an overall negative impact, but will compare in comparison to all of the positive gains we have seen so far and will continue to see in the century ahead. And I've seen you speak before and, you, you know, you seem by nature, you know, a very positive and almost, well, I say bubbly, I don't want to you know, diminish it, but, <laughs> but, but you, I mean, you, you the, but an optimistic outlook seems in some ways, and, and Matt Ridley, of course, wrote the rational optimist, but the, the, the going back to this idea of uh, uh, apocalyptic views and cataclysmic views and, and the preference for bad news, why, why is optimism on environmental issues and climate change so rare? Well, well, again, because it's much, much more fun to say, here is the end. Right? We're we're uh, they, they, they call it climate porn. Uh, when you, you, know, you read about this, this sort of the end of the world in all these different ways. Do you remember the, the day after, I think it was called the movie, where oh, you yes. see you yeah. know, uh, uh, the uh, Statue of Liberty being flooded and then frozen and all kinds of stuff. It's secretly thrilling. It's, you know, it tingles your, your, your I don't know what, uh, but, it, but it feels <laughs> interesting uh, in a way that saying, you know, trends are just going to continue. We're going to be better educated. We're going to eradicate more diseases. You're going to live longer. Your kids are going to be better educated. Uh, they'll have more opportunities. They'll have much higher incomes. And crucially, most of the rest of the world, which doesn't live like you and me and doesn't have anywhere near the opportunities, they will actually have many of the same opportunities. And, and again, the point is not, this is something that this guy from Denmark, you know, randomly sit and say is, is happening. This is what the UN climate panel is telling us. Why, why would they be even bothered about that? Well, because if you have to predict what the temperature is going to look like over the next hundred years, you also need to look at all the other th factors because obviously how rich we are, how much stuff we'll have, how long we'll live, all that stuff will impact how much we emit. So they've actually spent a lot of time making prognoses for what the world will look like. Now, obviously, that's not going to be true because we don't, we don't know what the world is going to look like for the next 80 years. But they've done you know, five big scenarios. They all tell us that you're going to live longer. You're going to be better off. You're going to have more income. You're going to be, in pretty much all respects, better off. The question is just how much better off. And sure. I think that's crucial. If you, if you look at most Hollywood films, you know, they will tell you, show you a very, very dismal uh, outlook on the uh, on the future again because that's fun it, it also you know sets you up for something that actually makes it you know the the battle interesting and all that stuff but just think about it if you'd done this in the in the beginning of uh of, you know say 1900 you would have made exactly the same thing you know oh no 2020 is going to be terrible it's going to be you know dismal and you know, you'll have all these robots that'll keep you down or you'll have all this garbage right. that you haven't cleaned up well actually 
We fix that. And it's true every time when you look at how people have forecast the world, they've always seen all the problems, they haven't seen the solutions. And, and you know, th there's a good reason for that. We can see all the problems, you can't see the solutions because they're in the future. But, the, but of course, our tendency tells us that there's a good reason why the future is gonna be better, not worse. Well, and those are great points. I just to come bring it back just briefly is there seems to me some religious overtones here as well. And I'm not the first one to point this out, right? That we've sinned, right? We're, we're living too well and the comeuppance is headed our way. We're, you know, we're oh, going to sure. pay, we're going to pay for this. Um, and, and, and it's even in the, in Michael Moore's film, the planet of the humans, it ends with this very dire, very down, downcast looking idea of the ideas about how, you know, we're going to, um, uh, we're going to pay, right? This is, hmm. the, the, this is all going to come back to us. Um, so uh, uh, you don't write about them in your book, not that I could see here anyway, but how culpable are the environmental, the big environmental groups for this kind of alarmism? Is this related to their ability to raise money or in that the, this idea that their, that their, no. their existence depends on alarmism? Is that fair? Well, so, I mean, I know a lot of these guys. I used to be, you know, a very, very pedestrian kind of member of, of, of one of them in, in Greenpeace. I, I think there's certainly, you know, there's some underlying factors that means that you do better if you fundraise with scary stuff. You know, if you send out a newsletter, almost no problems, give me money anyway, just in case, you're probably not going <laughs> to raise as much money. <laughs> but, you know, right. most of these people are really, really well-meaning. Uh, I've, I've, I've met a lot of them. I haven't met anyone that I fit, think are sort of cynically saying, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and lie because it'll make me more money. That's not how they think. I think, and again, in, in my worldview, it's fine that we have environmental organizations that sort of, you know, tell you the, the absolutely worst case outcome of all this, right? That's their job. You know, you want someone to be out there and say, it could go this bad. The point is, we shouldn't believe that they're the only arbiters of truth. I think yep. that's where we go wrong, that we somehow believe them. And also, of course, a lot of newspaper environmental journalists have, and this has been a long conversation in the academic literature, have com compared to pretty much all other uh, uh, reporters sort of become much more uh, uh, in, ingrained with the environmental movement and they're sort of almost campaigners for them. Whereas, you know, if, if you're a political reporter, uh, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, you'll ask hard questions, or you at least try to ask hard questions, both of your opponents, but also the people you tend to agree with. But unfortunately, many of the environmental reporters have, have adopted much of the worldview and then, you know, are, are almost uncritically giving you the same sort of argument. And I think that's where you really go wrong. It, just to give you one good example, I, I write about that in the book, and I think it's sort of very, it's, it's very, it, it sort of encapsulates this whole conversation. If you look at sea level rise, which is obviously one of the outcomes of, of climate change, as temperatures rise, seawater is going to get warmer as, uh, as things get warmer, just like you know, any, any other thing. It'll expand. And that's why you get sea level rise. So you will get higher sea level rise. You'll probably get, you know, in the worst case outcome, about three feet by the end of the century. If you just map that over the world as it is today, that means 187 million people are going to get flooded by the end of the century, or you know, realistically, they'll have to move. Now, and, you know, if you want to make really scary scenarios, you'll tell 187 million people are going to drown by the end of the century. Of course, that's not going to happen because it's over 80 years. But the reality is that those models also tell you this is not going to happen because obviously this assumes that nobody does anything for the next 80 years. You just sit there and watch the waves lap up over your, you know, your knees and eventually your hip and eventually you have to move. That's not how humans act. They actually uh, you know, put up a uh, higher sea level dikes uh, and, and therefore they can actually manage much of this. And the very same research that tells us 187 million people will be flooded if you don't do anything, tells us with realistic assumptions, you will see about 15,000 people being flooded or having to move by the end of the century. 187 million people is a catastrophe. 15,000 is something in, entirely manageable. And that's why we need to have this conversation. If you just say the 187 million, which most environmental groups obviously will do because it's better for fundraising, you need some journalists to say, I'm sorry, but doesn't the actual period research tell us 15,000 behind it? And unfortunately we're lacking that. And that's one of the things that my book try to do because unless you have that sort of realism check, you're not likely to be 
adequately worried. So that's, I want to talk about adaptation because I think that that's one of the areas that the, the, the people who are the climate activists just simply don't want to discuss, right? It's not part of it. But you mentioned early, uh, Ju early, uh, earlier uh, Julian Simon, and I, I've talked about this with uh, several of the guests on the podcast. To what extent are we still arguing over Malthus? I mean, that he's been dead a long time now, over 200 years, but that uh, it, how much of this fundamentally traces back to that same uh, limited view of ingenuity, limited view of hmm. uh, that, that uh, Paul Ehrlich carried forward in his famous bet again with, with Julian Simon. How much of this traces back to Malthus? Well, so I think very little of it traces back to Malthus, but it is the same thing. It's the same fight that we have over and over again. The reason why Malthus was obvious was he basically said, look, lots of problems. What are you going to do? You know, that just accumulates. Eventually, we're all going to die from all of this, all these problems. And then the sort of the, op the opposition, the economists would say, well, actually, ingenuity fixes a lot of these problems. Uh, Julian Simon made a big deal out of the fact that Malthus himself changed over his life and, you know, his uh, fourth and fifth uh, 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 public publication of the book actually was a lot more optimistic. He was still, you know, he also had a lot of religious, obviously, uh, 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 issues which somewhat prevented him from, from, from taking the full outcome of that. But, you know, fundamentally, when you get into this, you start realizing, oh, people are actually pretty damn smart and they fix a lot of these problems. Uh, and, and so I think it's much more, and, and Julian Simon actually wrote about this, if you're, a, if you're a natural science person, you're not used to thinking about the fact that things adapt to what you're doing. You know, temperatures rise, sea levels rise, things get flooded. But of course, for social science people like me and like Julian Simon, we're used to realizing, oh wait, people will actually make a big difference in that. So if you if you work with you know with rabbits, rabbits are just going to multiply until there's nothing left, and you know they'll eat up the whole the whole shebang. But we're not rabbits, and that's why I think there's a big divide between natural science and social science, and you need both. Look, I'm not a climate scientist. I'm incredibly happy that there's a lot of climate scientists out here who do all the models and who tell us what, you know, with these impacts, these inputs, these are the outcomes that we'll have. But we also need to remember the social science bit. And I think that's the real point. It's not about that we're going to adapt. Of course, we're going to adapt. But the idea is that without adaptation built into the models, you're going to get phenomenally misleading outcomes. You know, 187 million people are going to get flooded instead of 15,000. One is great for fundraising, great for scaring your kids, very, very bad for predicting the future. So you mentioned uh, your, you know, that that Julian Simon uh, uh, thing that you read back in '97. So was that yeah. the turning point for you? I mean, was there that one moment where you said, "No, this is what I'm going to to focus on"? That that no. really. Or was this a, just no. a gradual I mean, process uh, for, of you for, looking for, at these issues? Yes. For, first of all, I don't. It, it'd be very, very weird if there was a turning point because then you've sort of said, "All right, now I've I've decided I'm going to look at the world in a totally different way." No, it was more sort of a. It was an astounding experience of 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 all the things that I've heard. I I have you know. Uh, Afterwards, I got to be sort of a minor celebrity in Denmark, uh, and and uh, I'd I'd written uh, uh, you know when I was still a student, I'd written a, a, a letter to the editor where I was de demeaning somebody else who wasn't too worried about global warming, saying we're all going to drown, kind of thing. And of course, you know, people love that. See, and, and you know, th that was what I'd heard. That was what I thought. You know, and and I was surprised that the stuff that I'd heard was not actually reflected in the academic literature when you actually looked at the data. And that was, of course, sort of my, my whole trip towards realizing you can't just rely on what you've read in the paper. You actually need to go to the academic literature, to, you know, in the climate uh, conversation, to the IPC. But this is true across a wide range of areas where we tend to believe that we know what's right and what's wrong. Uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the things I've, I've found, you know, I, we do a lot of work in third world countries. Um, most people will believe that HIV and malaria are the most important infectious diseases. They're actually not. They're the most heard infectious diseases because, you know, there's lots of interest groups campaigning for HIV especially, but also for malaria. Actually, TB is by far, tuberculosis, by far the biggest killer in the world. 
but you don't hear about it because it's uh, you know uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, trauma and 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 people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to you know tell anyone that they had it. There's there's taboo around it, that kind of thing. So the actual fact is that most people know very well that malaria and HIV are big problems, but they don't know about TB, which is one of the reasons why we constantly find that some of the best deals for many developing countries are in TB, because we've forgotten to talk about it. And so there are very, very cheap things to be done where you can help lots of people at very low cost. That's the exact point. So I try to constantly keep people, uh, you know, give people a sense of how big of a problem is this? What can you do? What else could you spend your resources on? Well, that's a great uh, uh, lead into this next, I want to get back to this year, year 2004, you convened the, the group of top scientists to talk about the world's most pressing problems that that became the Copenhagen consensus. Um, and the it's described this way, the core idea is simple, with scarce resources to tackle the problems of the world, prioritization is necessary not being really willing to prioritize does not make the problem go away. It simply becomes less clear. We need to know what we should do first. And then you force rank them. And looking back, you, the, you said the priorities and, and, and looking backward appear pretty prescient. Hunger and second was health and disease. And that now we're in the middle of the pandemic. And you mentioned the WHO this morning saying, well, climate change is a, is a big priority and perhaps taking the, the eye off the ball. Um, but it, let me let me go then to 2008. You convened again, uh, and and reducing CO2 emissions out of 30 challenges ranked 30th. I mean that's a pretty remarkable. I mean even after a tax on tobacco. Um, it, it, so uh, my question is, you've been coming to the same conclusions uh, now for for quite a while. Um, so uh, the alarmism just continues to get top billing because. As you said, it sells, even though you you keep coming to these same kinds of of findings over and hmm. over. It, it, so just just to give you a sense, we, we worked together with lots of economists. We actually did our last prioritization back in 2015 with the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and we came out with pretty much the same conclusion. But but fundamentally, we ask economists in a wide range of areas to say, how could you spend a dollar and spend it really smartly? And how much would that good? How much good would that do for humanity? Then we ask that question around the, around all the different areas, and then basically say, would you do more good spending a dollar on cutting CO two, or uh, you know, giving clean drinking water, or you know, tackling tuberculosis, or tackling uh, uh, gender inequality, and all these other things that you might want to talk about? And the the simple point is, some of these things are incredibly cheap and simple to do. Some of these things are incredibly expensive and won't do very. Much much good. It's not about that they're not all good. It's simply that some of them happen to be a lot more effective. So let's do those first. This is just not exciting, right? The, you would never get, you, you're probably not going to put this on the top of your, of your billing of, of, of this podcast because nobody would click on it. What people do so, click so, on. But, is, but, I can, but if I can interrupt, yeah. so I mean, it, it seems to me that continually and throughout the book, it was, well, it's either or. We have a trade off here, right? That this, if we do this, we get that. Or if we spend it here, that, yeah, I, I, that's the recurring theme throughout the book is, well, this study says if we spend a, you know, this much here, we get this much benefit. But that, um, but it goes back to the same idea we talked about earlier, where if climate change is existential, then no price is too high. Well, no, that's yep. not the case. I mean, yep. that's your that's your argument you've effectively been making now for twenty years, and which means my, my next question, and I and I mean this no disrespect, you get tired of repeating yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and why, why haven't I convinced people yet? So, uh, so you know, that's I, a, I, I think a, I think a, yeah, I, I think I think fundamentally the point here is we we are genetically engineered to get things wrong in a specific way. Yeah, you know, we're the guys, we're the survivors of the guy who were really worried about the saber tooth tiger and you know, all these other things. There's probably a lot of good evolutionary reasons why we over worry about some things. And we, you know, we tend to get a perception that, oh my God, this is very, very important. And, and I couldn't possibly be bothered about this. What we try to do and what I try to do with this argument is exactly to try to get us to be a little more rational. So my goal is not, we have a saying at the Copenhagen consensus, this is not about getting it right. It's about getting it slightly less wrong. 
Uh, you know, it's a much more modest goal. I'm simply trying to push people a little bit towards don't sp don't waste quite as much money on the things that look good but don't actually do very much. Try to spend slightly more on the really smart stuff. I would love, obviously, for all of us to be incredibly rational, but I don't think that's going to happen. And so, in in some sense, I think the point that I try to make is simply pushing us a little bit towards rationality. And that requires two things, as you rightly point out in climate change. One is to tackle the, it's the end of the world. Because if it is the end of the world, we should spend everything uh, on this problem. It's not the end of the world, it's a problem. The second thing is to get people to realize that most of the things that we're actually spending money on in climate are fairly costly. That is in terms of GDP, you know, we're spending percents of GDP. It's not going to bring us to the poorhouse, but it's certainly, you know, something that is measurable, that have real impacts on people's lives. And yet the impact when you run it through the climate models will be trivial. So, you know, just to give you a sense of proportion, the, uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, if we keep doing the Paris Agreement, which, of course, no nation is doing right now, uh, the U.S. is out of Paris, uh, but you know, we'll see whether you're back in. Uh, but no nation is actually, or very, very few nations, and none of the important ones are living up to uh, their, their, uh, their uh, Paris promises. But if they all did that and did it through the whole century, it would reduce temperatures by the end of the century by about 0 0.3 degree Fahrenheit. But it would cost in the order of, you know, let's say, 80 to 150 trillion dollars. That's a lot of money for almost no benefit. So every dollar would probably do about 11 cents of climate good. That is, it would avoid climate damages worth 11 cents, which is obviously a bad way to spend the dollar and translate it into 11 cents of good for humanity. But the fundamental point here is to rec get people to recognize that's a bad idea, but you can only get that if you've stopped believing this is the end of the world. So let me, let's fast forward then to your solutions, your, your view on, on what we should be doing. And you talk about a carbon tax. And of course, this is now being, you know, coming around again in the United States has been talked about now for 30 years. Um, and way back when in the 90s, I wrote a piece thinking, oh, well, let's do a carbon tax. I've since come to think, well, we can't get an international agreement to ban landmines. How are we ever <laughs> going to get an international agreement to uh, to impose a, a tax on the most important uh, commodity in the global economy? A, a little criticism or a little pushback on the idea of carbon tax. How do we get that international agreement? Because you say, well, we should have this and we should fund R&D. But how do you convince Vietnam, Bangladesh, Pakistan, the developing countries that, oh, this is good for you? And then second to Nordhaus's point, because Nordhaus makes the same same argument, how do you get this this international uh, harmonization, right? The cross border mm. tariffs. How do how yeah. do you solve that? Because you didn't you you didn't you didn't talk about that much in the book. How do you, how do you get people to agree? I, I actually do argue that it's very unlikely we will get this one global right. carbon tax, yeah. and that we'll much more likely model through. Uh, I also emphasize that while carbon tax is absolutely the intellectually academically most correct first order uh, uh, solution it's very likely that it won't work and it certainly won't fix most of the problem. So right. I think it's important to say carbon tax is in principle a good idea. There is a real risk that we won't do it right. There's a, uh, there's a potential that we'll actually screw it up really badly and we can come back to that. But also, even if we get it right, it's not going to fix all that much of the problem. And if it does what it has done in the US, and I think the US in some ways is a little unique in that respect, but if it ends up screwing up everything else about climate change, that is, you get people so entrenched on, we either want this or we don't want this, that you can't get anything else done, then maybe it was the wrong battle to try to win. So I'm simply going to defend it as an intellectual uh, sure. proposition. Look, if you emit CO2, that means you cause a little bit more discomfort down the line for the whole world. And we can, you know, sort of reasonably estimate that. And obviously that's fraught with all kinds of problems, but let's just say it's about 20 to $30 per, uh, for a ton of CO2. That means if we put a tax of 20 to $30 on that ton of CO2, you would reflect that in your decision. So if it was worth more than 20, sorry, $30 for you, you'd still do it. Right. And that would be, uh, worthwhile because you would have produced something that was worth more than $30 for the world and you would have caused problems worth less than $30. That's a socially good outcome. 
but you would also have refrained from doing so if it was you know frivolous or, and really just worth one dollar uh, sure. for you but it would have cost twenty nine dollars for for prosperity that's the basic point of it if you do this you will fix a little bit of the problem but yes, you're absolutely right. There's very good reason to believe, first, we're not going to do it well. That means we'll actually have higher cost. And I talk a lot about that in the book. And also, if it breaks down your conversations about all the other smart things, this was not the hill that you should have died on. So let's say, yes, it is a good argument. And I also think the reason why I lead with it in the book is also, it's a good way to frame it inside your mind to think about what is the problem of a ton of CO2? Well, it's about $30. It's much, much easier than just, it's the end of the world. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, right. It's yeah. $30. And we actually have a real reasonably good number on that. So in, in, in talking about these ideas of solutions, issue, uh, policy pathways, you really, I think more than any other talk about the need for adaptation. Why is that idea about, ad, ad, and it's something that in my experience, and, and uh, just a quick station break here, I'm talking to Bjorn Lomborg. I should have uh, introduced this a little bit, uh, for a, little <laughs> bit of, uh, a while ago. We're talking about his new book, False Alarm, How Climate Change Panic Costs Us Trillions, Hurts the Poor, and Fails to Fix the Planet. You can find it on all the major book selling outlets and you can also visit copenhagenconsensus.org is that right um, com. Uh, dot com copenhagen 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 com. dot com um so why don't why doesn't or why don't uh more people want to talk about the need for adaptation i i, I find that that part of the discussion really doesn't get i mean there's some and you see that you mentioned the 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 efforts in New York City after the uh, Superstorm Sandy, um, all of those things are going to have big, big benefits relative to their cost. Why is adaptation not a popular thing to talk about when it comes to climate? So I think it's, there, there's two reasons. Partly, partly it feels pedestrian when you're talking about, especially if you're sort of, we're all going to die. Then, you know, putting a, a plastic cover on the subways seem like it's so pedestrian, it almost seems like that shouldn't be possible to you know, solve the problem of us all dying. Not, not, uh, se not, so sexy, not sexy enough? It's, it's not sexy enough. And, and the second thing, of course, is a lot of people have felt, and I think with some justification, that the more you talk about adaptation, the more you take away from the politically correct solution, which is cutting carbon emissions. Uh, you know, if you say we can adapt to most of this, you don't actually need to cut all that much CO2. So the people who want to cut emissions don't want to talk about adaptation. Now, I think you know, that's just intellectually spurious and dishonest. You know, you, you need to you know, say this is one of the ways that we're going to fix climate change. You should also recognize that most of the things that you're going to do with adaptation will happen on a private basis because it makes private good sense. You know, you're going to decide, am I going to buy a beachfront property if, you know, sea levels in a hundred years are going to have risen up over the beachfront or at least eroded quite a bit of my beach or whatever that is. You will make those decisions and you will make them on your own. Now, some of the investments that you're going to have to do, for instance, on protecting sea, uh, seashore lines is going to have to be social. And in that way, we need to have that conversation. But much of the uh, adaptation is actually going to be private. You know, so seed companies developing new seeds, they'll better be, be able to uh, better handle uh, uh, saline intrusion or whatever that, uh, that concern might be. And there will be a market for that. So you also talk about uh, using carbon taxation. You're not the only one. Roger Pilkey Jr., uh, who's been on the podcast, has talked about the same issue of, well, let's have a modest carbon tax. Let's put a lot of that money into R&D. Uh, you talk about nuclear, and um, I'm adamantly pro-nuclear. In my view, if you're anti-nuclear and anti-carbon dioxide, you're pro-blackout. Well, I'm anti-blackout, right? We're gonna, <laughs> if we really are serious about reducing CO2, we need a lot more nuclear energy. But nuclear, frankly, is stuck. I mean, it really is. Um, and you mentioned the issue of cost as being one of the key uh, obstacles, um, and particularly in Western countries. Um, is there more than cost, though, in terms of thinking about nuclear longer term? What, are the, what do you see as the biggest hurdles, to make the question, what, what do you see as the biggest hurdles into implementing uh, nuclear at scale that can make a significant difference? So uh, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm actually going to just widen your question a little okay, bit, because sure, I think the, the, the real issue here is to say, look, we're going to ask, we're asking people to say the stuff that has made you rich for the last 200 years, namely widely available and cheap energy, 
you have to switch away from these cheap things like coal, gas, and, uh, and oil. If you want people to do that, you've got to give them an alternative that's cheaper and nice and better. If you do that, everyone will switch. Nuclear power could be one of those. If nuclear power was incredibly cheap and just simple to put up, you know, these, these four generation uh, things, you know, you have like this, this uh, uh, half uh, container kind of uh, uh, a little nuclear power plant and it'll, you know, it, it'll immediately power your whole village and, you know, it'll give you all the stuff that you want. Hey, hey we'd all just buy it and we'd be done with climate change. Right. And the simple point is if we had any one of those innovations, we would be done with climate change. We'd just simply fix it. Nuclear power is one of those ways that you can solve it. We know that this works, but as you also point out, right now, nuclear power is incredibly expensive, very likely because there's been a lot of uh, uh, very expensive regulation. Uh, but again, I don't see anyone being willing to, and I don't see anyone winning say, let's make nuclear a little less safe. That's right. just not gonna you know, work out. What could work out, is, and that's what you know, Bill Gates and many others are investing in, is fourth generation nuclear. Right now we have third generation, fairly expensive. We know it works. If you could get fourth generation to be much cheaper, safer, and easy, then you would win. But that could also happen in so many other ways. So imagine if you could have incredibly cheap solar and wind with lots and lots of storage. We can get into whether that's realistic, but you know, at least as a principle, it certainly should be. If you uh, could, for instance, do geothermal. Now we know, for instance, that fracking technology could make it much more likely that we can actually get a little bit of the same thing, that you could utilize the, the heat of the earth and you could get baseload power that way. That could be another solution. Uh, Craig Venter, the guy who uh, cracked the human genome back in 2000, he talks about making this algae on the ocean surface that produces oil. So it would you know, soak up sunlight and CO2 create oil, we could have our whole uh, you know, fossil fuel uh, 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 economy, and it would be emitting the CO2 that it had just taken up out on the ocean surface, so it would be CO2 neutral. Again, this doesn't work at all at scale, and it's not cost effective, but more research could make it so. My point is, and I think this is really what the climate economics tell us very clearly, that if we spend a lot of resources across all these different technological opportunities. We're likely to fail in most of them. That's how research and development works. But we just really need one or more realistically, a few of these to come through. And those are the technologies that'll power the rest of the 21st century. So there's really two ways to fix climate. One is to say, let's convince everyone to go down a route that's gonna be very costly, that's gonna be very inconvenient, that's gonna leave us all worse off by promising to cut carbon emissions really difficultly, or, Let's do a technological solution. Let's find the technologies that are going to be incredibly cheap that everyone will just want. Obviously, you know, not surprisingly, when I'm putting it up, it's an obvious solution. Then you should pick the second one. You should pick technology. And, and it goes back to what we also talked about earlier with you know, Paul Ehrlich and the whole worry that the world was going to run out of food in the late 1960s. If you thought about, you know, oh my God, there's not enough food in the world. How are we possibly going to feed everyone? One option would be to say, let's tell everyone in the U.S. to stop eating those, you know, damn cows and just become vegetarians and send all the rest of the food down to India and all these countries that need it. And then maybe we can, you know, keep this going for a little longer. That would not only have been incredibly hard, it would probably also fail. We could also have said, let's make it such that each acre of land produces lots more food. Oh, and that was what we did. That was the green revolution. And that was essentially why India today, instead of being the basket case that everybody thought, and it was not just you know, um, Paul Early who thought that, thought that back in the 1960s that they were just gonna die. That's why they have actually got an enormous population and they're the world's leading rice exporter. They have more food than they could ever possibly know what to do with. So, you know, one of the beautiful things is Technology solves problems in a way that makes it possible that everyone, almost everyone wins. Whereas the solution that we've picked so far is let's make it as hard for everyone to accept these, uh, these solutions. You know, let's all suffer with higher energy costs and less availability, more blackout risks, and, and try and see if we can convince the Chinese and the Indians and the Africans and the Latin Americans to do the same. And not surprisingly, we keep failing.
Well, as you say that, there was something that just popped in my head that there's, you're talking about a technological approach versus a, a one that is more regulatory centric, I guess. And the part that, as you said it, I, it was something clicked where I thought, well, that regulatory centric model then is much more of a top down approach, right? It is much more of a government hand, a heavier hand of the government saying, this is what we're going to do rather than a bottom up uh, more capitalist friendly kind of approach. Is that fair? Well, it's somewhat fair, but, but I know that you would like it to be more true than it probably is because the, the, the innovation bit is a lot of people will say, oh yes, I love innovation. We should get companies to innovate more. Well, the problem by getting companies to innovate more is that they also have a very, very short you know, time frame. They want to sure. you know, get something that'll get to market in a couple of years. So they will basically take all the subsidy money for innovation, put it into the product that they were going to launch anyway in a couple of years, and we'll get almost no extra R&D out of it. The difficulty, and this is sort of the economic argument, uh, the academic argument is, there's a lot of investment in very immediate R&D because you can market it next year, but there's a severe underinvestment in R&D for the next 40 years. This is not just true in energy, but also you know, in health and, where and, we know and, this much and, better. And that's, and that's where we need the government part, right? Yes. That, 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 because, that government is gonna have to play that role in the R&D. Well, and, and just to push that point further, it seems to me that that's gonna be particularly true when it comes to nuclear, because you're going to need much more international cooperation like the IAEA, if you're gonna have uh, a nuclear uh, growing at scale in multiple countries around the world. Is that, is that, is that how you see it as well? I think it's hard to predict exactly how you're going to fix the the nuclear problem because a large part of the problem is that people are just incredibly worried, you know, and happen to have the same you know, base word as, as nuclear weapons and, you know, right. made a lot of people very worried. Uh, and there's a lot of emotion involved in this. I don't think you're going to be able to be successful in getting IA or any other international organization to tell the U.S. or any, any nation in Europe exactly how they're going to regulate their nuclear power. I think it's going to be a lot easier once you see, oh, you know, you can pay, uh, you know, uh, 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 four to 10 cents per kilowatt hour for your power uh, with the stuff that you already have, or you can pay two cents for this new nuclear. Once that happens, most people are gonna be like, how can we make this fit into our regulatory status? And, and you know, it'll work. Economics has a tendency of making, you know, once you can do something cheap, people will actually follow. But, but I think the, the big thing that you need to get people to understand is, we've had this solution for the last many decades in healthcare, we re realized that Pfizer, Pfizer, sorry, I can't say that word right, or some of these other big pharmaceuticals are not actually gonna make the research that in 40 years will lead to a major breakthrough because by then their patent will have run out. Sure. And so they will get very little of that benefit. Humanity will greatly benefit, but they won't get it. So they won't invest in it. That's why we have lots and lots of researchers in lots of universities making Nobels and interesting stuff that only you know, 20, 30, 40 years later becomes something that you can actually market and Pfizer can get rich off of. And we need the same thing in energy. And one of the reasons why we don't have this conversation, why we don't spend very much on research in, in, in energy is because we constantly have the sense of the world is ending tomorrow. We don't have time to wait for 20 to 40 years. And, 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 and my standard sort of comeback is to say, well, first of all, that's not true. But secondly, what you're essentially suggesting is let's do more of the stuff, more of the policies that have failed for the last 30 years. Let's try to do more of that. That's not likely to actually fix any of the problems that you really worry about. Whereas I'm saying, let's fix something that will actually fix the problem in the next 20 to 40 years. Yes, it's not gonna happen overnight. And I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do that can sort of magically make that happen, but we can do something that'll fix a large part of it likely over the next 40 years. So when you, and that, that makes sense. When, when you, going through that explanation, I thought, well, then what I'm, what, what pops in my head is well, when it comes to nuclear, then when it comes to the international regulation, the innovation is going to have to come first and the regulation will follow that then. Is that, yeah. is that, that I think that, that, that yes. That, that, and, that, and, that, yeah, that and, and I think that's, that's what, you know, uh, uh, the Gates uh, uh, consortium and many others have taken a lot of their nuclear uh, uh, research to China uh, because there's easier regulation there. Uh, but I think fundamentally you just need to come up with this technology and say, see, it's incredibly safe. 
Yeah. And it's incredibly cheap. And that's how we're going to, you know, just like with these algae on the, on the ocean surface. Imagine if Craig Venter, you know, not only would he probably become the richest man in the world, but he could actually offer us all in incredibly cheap oil. How cool would that be? You know, right. th there's, there's an enormous amount of these solutions. And it's one of those that will likely fix climate change, not because we care deeply, deeply about climate change, but because we cared really much about getting very cheap energy and sure. very cheap energy. Oh, and fixed climate would be sort of the, the, the bonus of package. Right. So if you look at the, the I, I look at the hydrocarbon business and have for some time, if you look at coal oil and natural gas, if you look at those three, is there one that you see gaining more traction than any other? Well, it's very clear that that you know fracking has dramatically sh shifted from coal to gas, and that has been good for climate. It's probably also been very good for uh, for normal pollution, which is actually a big problem still in the U.S. Uh, and that's wonderful. Uh, you know, the U.S. Has, has clocked in the largest reduction of any nation in the world in the 2010s because of fracking. Right. Uh, so you definitely want to move people from coal to gas simply because gas emits about half the amount of CO2 and it's also much cleaner and other parameters. And you want to do the same thing in China. Those are the kinds of easy solutions. And, and remember again, the US didn't switch from coal to gas because they were incredibly worried about global warming. They switched because gas suddenly became much cheaper. And in that way, it's a great example of saying, you know, if you come with a new thing and say, hey, this is cheaper, people will switch. Yeah, you know, it's not rocket science. And the trick that we have to make sure is that that new thing is not only cheaper, but also greener. If we can do both of those, we'll just simply have solved a large part of the problem. So fracking has solved part of the problem. And again, I, and I also emphasize in that book, fracking is not without problems. You know, the sure. latest study shows that fracking probably on an annual basis incur a cost for the US of about $25 billion. That's a lot of money. Most of this is actually air pollution, not water pollution as most people would think. You know, a lot of trucking and a lot of uh, 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 emissions uh, close to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the fracking sites. But the benefits are in the order of $160 billion. So right. benefits vastly outweigh the cost. But again, that doesn't mean that somebody is actually suffering those costs. And you need to make sure that those people are also well off. Now, in North Dakota, they are because they own the land. So they're typically sure. willing to say, sure, you know, I'll have a new Chevy and you know, <laughs> I'm fine with a little more air pollution. But you need to make sure that that happens generally. That's a conversation we need to have. But once you have that, you have general benefits, people are going to love it. And that's, of course, how we need to do this with uh, uh, innovation on, on green energy as well. So the other key point that you make in, in the book is that we need to get richer, that, that the, the solution to a lot of this, and, and I, I write about it in my new book and my new film, I talk about the issue of poverty and electricity and how electricity is essential. But if you look at the headlines, your argument that we should not be impeding the development of, the, of, of, of poorer countries is, is losing. You said last year, the European Investment Bank, world's largest development bank, announced it would quit financing fossil fuel projects. Uh, BlackRock has said it will quit funding coal plants and screen its funds for hydrocarbon projects. So it, it appears, despite the obvious fact that energy is key to raising people's standards of living, that the the big money outlets are saying, well, we're not going to. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna sound make it sound meaner and more diabolical than it is. They're essentially saying to the developing world and and some of the environmental groups are saying, no, you can't use hydrocarbons, only renewables for you. Is no. it, it, there's a, there's a financial issue here, but it seems is is there also a moral issue at stake? Well, of course there are. And, and that's one of the reasons why I say that this also hurts the poor, that we're essentially telling both the poor and the rich world in the U.S., uh, you know, for, for instance, fracking has meant that uh, the gas became cheaper. Uh, also in the U.S., for people who keep warm in the winter, that actually meant about 11,000 fewer deaths because they can now afford to keep their homes better heated. And so they don't die as much from, uh, from, uh, from cold related deaths. If you raise the tax on fuels because you want to fix climate change, that means some of those 11,000 or maybe all of them are going to go back to dying every year. That has real consequences. But obviously, it's much, much bigger for people in Bangladesh and elsewhere where you actually need 
much, much more energy to have access. And, and there, is, there is sort of a, a, a rich world tendency here where you say, well, you know, if this is the end of the world, I'm sorry, the poor will just have to wait a little bit to become uh, less poor. Uh, I've heard people, and, you know, I'm not going to quote names, but, you know, important people basically saying, look, uh, we only have, what, 10 years to fix climate change. They'll still be poor in 2030. Then we'll fix their problem then. And, and I can see in the framework of this is the end of the world. This is a meteor hurtling towards the uh, uh, ending the earth. We got to do something right now. That makes sense. And that's, of course, why actually realizing, no, it's not a meteor. It's not the end of the world. It's a problem. That not only means that we're likely to make better climate policies, but it also means we're likely to make less really, really ugly and immoral choices like saying, I'm sorry, this is so important that the developing world just can't you know, be, be well off. And, and, but, and of but course, then, but, but the second thing is also to remember, just, sorry, very briefly, they're not going to let us do that. You know, the, uh, China is not going to say, all right, okay, then we'll be poor. Uh, there are some impacts on, on this, but very clearly, uh, we're, we're just going to lose a lot of impact in that. And that's, of course, why the Chinese World Bank is actually becoming more and more important in much developing countries, because they will still fund a coal-fired power plant. Well, and I think, and the Chinese, or the, you mentioned the Chinese, the Japanese as well, and, and other, other lenders, Malaysia, South Korea, et cetera. Um, so we've been talking for about an hour. My guest is Bjorn Lomborg, uh, the president of the Copenhagen, uh, Copenhagen Consensus uh, Center, and also the author of his new book, False Alarm, How Climate Change Panic Costs Us Trillions, Hurts the Poor, and Fails to Fix the Planet. So uh, I, as I said, we've been talking about an hour. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but um, I have to ask you this because this is something that people talk about, and, uh, and I'll just cut right to So why the black shirt? <laughs> uh, so... I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to preface it by saying Sergio Marchionne was the, the head of Fiat Chrysler for years. He had an outfit, right? He wore a black, a black, uh, a black sweater. Uh, the former head of Ford Motor Company wore the same thing. Uh, his name escapes me at the moment. Wore the same outfit. Johnny Cash wore the same outfit. you one of your signature things is the black t-shirt on television uh, today. Uh, why the black t-shirt? Yeah. So, I mean, there's not a, 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 an enormous sort of thought out uh, a point behind it. Uh, I, I used to just wear uh, T-shirts when I was uh, teaching at the university. Uh, and and um, uh, when I needed to sort of dress up, I'd wear black T-shirts. So actually, this is sort of my formal T-shirt. <laughs> um, and, and, and when I... <laughs> This is this is my you know and 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 when I occasionally do really really important things I iron it, uh, and and then uh, uh, the first times when I started getting into this whole conversation you know people were uh, I was at this one uh, TV studio and they were really insistent on me putting on a jacket they you know got someone else's jacket and said don't you want to put this on, and I was like that doesn't feel like me. And, and, and so I said, no, I, you know, I just want to go on like I am. This is who I am. And, and so honestly, I think it just sort of became a, a, a signature afterwards, uh, but it was not something I intended. Uh, so actually, early on, I had like a, 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 a light green t-shirt. I just picked the next one. You know, I'm, this is Corona. I'm just sitting at home working. Nobody cares. So I put this black t-shirt on for you. This is my, uh, this is my, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to the gala dinner uh, uh, with you. So does it, uh, well, I mean, I, 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 I ask it sincerely, but it's also become one of your signature things. So I'm assuming you're not going to change it. This is what you're going to stick with. No, no. So I, I think there's one more, one other thing, obviously, is the, the fact that, that when you, uh, when you hear me, when, when, when I first started this conversation, I remember I got, I got sort of drawn by some people who were saying, you know, he's just a stooge of right-wing Americans kind of thing. And they drew me with a suit and tie and, you know, sort of like the spokesperson of, of the right wing in the U.S. Uh, and, and I think there's something slightly disarming about, oh, what? Yeah, he's sort of more dressing like a Greenpeace guy. And, and again, I'm, I'm not saying that that's what I'm trying to achieve. I'm more sort of saying, I'm not the guy you think I am. Uh, and, you know, if, if that sort of, if that t-shirt makes you so, sort of say, okay, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to hear from that guy, so I'm going to keep my, my mind a little open, uh, I, I, I hope that works. But, you know, honestly, it's just because that's how I dress every day.
Fair enough. And one, so one last thing about that, because I've heard from someone else, it's actually in some of your speaking contracts that you're not, you're not going to show. Is that, is that true? Oh, sure. But that's, that's more because we've been at some places where I had to get smuggled in, you know, uh, where, where I was giving a speech in a, you know, this very old fashioned kind of place where you have to wear a jacket. Uh, and I don't want to wear a jacket and they would, you know, it'd be weird if I had to sort of put on a jacket. So I had to go in by the waiter's entrance and stuff like that. So we just make sure that it's not going to be a problem. It's not because I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, that, that it's, it's sort of a marketing. It's more sort of to avoid uh, this becoming really awkward at a very late stage, gotcha. a very late stage. Gotcha. So just along those same lines, because you mentioned that this divide, why is that issue of, uh, and, and you mentioned that, oh, well, they think I'm this right wing stooge, right? And this is what the common effort of deplatforming and, you know, and I face some of the same things myself in my career. Oh, well, you're just talking for those people. You don't, you know, it doesn't matter whether how many books I've written or how long I've been studying this. Oh, well, you just work for them. Why is this issue of climate, though, so divisive on the left, right? I'm, I'm not going to say conservative versus liberal or Democrat versus Republican, but it's so much of a left, right issue. Why, how do you see that? Why has it become such a, a partisan issue in terms of the political spectrum? I, I think it may very well be part of what we also talked about earlier, the, uh, uh, the carbon tax, uh, that there's a lot of people, you know, on the left who thinks in general, you know, more taxes are good and it can fund a, a bigger government that we're going to do all these wonderful things with. And on the right, uh, you know, don't give government more money because they're just going to use it badly. And it's just going to be, you know, this thing that you'll just keep on turning. Uh, and, and I think both are, both arguments have validity. You know, I think carbon tax is a good way. You, know, you want to tax bad things rather than good things. You know, uh, if you can move it away from personal taxation towards uh, uh, taxation of, you know, pollution, uh, CO2, that, that makes for smart move that kind of thing but but I think that's part of the reason why you've you've gotten this uh, this divide I I think there's also a sense in which there's an overlap between the the correct conversation on climate change and then a wide range of other things you know the whole uh, 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 sentiment that we have it too good that we're you know people are wastefully using too many too much stuff you know i i i meet quite a number of people who you know honestly believe that we should degrow in, in the rich world uh they're they're invariably rich people uh you know uh, uh, uh well based and you know when you then start asking so would you be okay with not living with that would you be okay with giving up that Th that's not what they mean clearly you know <laughs> they don't actually want to give up any of their own stuff but you know in general people should give up all the frivolous stuff you know the stuff others have right. uh, and and you know it's very easy to have that sort of sentiment and i i think those kinds of things uh the idea that we generally need to you know uh, uh, uh have more government to control you know general stuff uh because we're not doing this well i think sent, uh, uh, vibes very well with the left wing and likewise the uh, the right wing have sort of an innate skepticism than any any government can do any good and as you can probably hear you know i'm, I'm sort of a slight lefty in a european sense so you know probably pretty damn lefty in in a european uh, sorry in a in a u.s context uh so but i also come from you know uh, governments that are that are good, you know, fundamentally, uh, the Scandinavian governments are good at delivering services. You actually get a lot of value for your money. If you can get government to be good, you can actually make it do a lot of smart stuff. That doesn't mean you should let it do all stuff. I think we've very, very clearly ex uh, experienced there are lots of stuff so, you shouldn't so, have governments to so do. So it comes, it comes down to more of the, the issue of government control over over basic liberty issues, right? That there's yeah. the fear on the right that overweening government will then say, no, you can't use that gasoline. I mean, we see it yes. written about it, in fact, in, in California, these bans on natural gas in, in homes. I mean, and who's fighting it? Well, the, well, some of the litigation is by the California Restaurant Association. I mean, the restaurants are saying, wait a minute, we cook with gas and you're going to tell us we can't use it? I mean, it, but it does seem to be that that, that that regulatory issue is maybe the one that that is the key Device, uh, dividing factor, but um, let me let me move on here and just a couple of, of of last quick things. So, who are your personal heroes? You you write a lot. You have a, a, a bookshelves groaning there behind you with lots of books on them. Who do you whose work do you admire? So, 
I uh, so I, I I love a lot of the economists that I that I read. So you know Richard Tull, uh, uh, William Nordhaus, some of those guys have done amazing stuff. Uh, I actually love uh, Jared Diamond. You know his uh, although we we dramatically disagree on some of the stuff that he that he writes. You know uh, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel is one of the is probably the book I would most love to have uh, written. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of smart people out there and I love, you know, good arguments, uh, sort of, oh, wait, that, you know, the stuff that sort of make your brain move a little bit and then click. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I really like. It's not like I think there's any, you know, sort of amazing, outstanding uh, uh, people. It's more sort of, I, I, I love the fact that I can spend a large portion of my day reading smart people, uh, uh, what they've done and try to synthesize some of that. That's great. I, I met Richard Toll once in, uh, uh, at, at a meeting in California with the Breakthrough Institute, in fact, and I asked him, I said, well, what would you do on the climate? He said uh, carbon tax was one of the things but, uh, that he would implement. But he's been pilloried as well. I mean, by the Guardian, by, I mean, I'm really attacked viciously uh, for uh, taking what it seems like are pretty, uh, I mean, uh, not extra, not ex extremist positions, but it, I guess, is that just something that just comes with the neighborhood? You come, you get into the fight, you're going to get those kinds of attacks. I, I think, you know, if, if, if we could just move it to William Nordhaus, because it's so obvious, you know, he, he's the only guy to get the Nobel prize in climate economics. Uh, he's an incredibly smart guy, very, very bright, uh, I think very intellectually stimulating. Uh, he's basically founded and helped, you know, shape this whole uh, uh, climate economics the last 30 years. Uh, and people are regularly pillaging him for that one reason, that he comes out with the wrong result. He tells us we should do something, but not too much in climate change. Now, the very simple point is, you know, you shouldn't do nothing because it's a problem. And the first ton of CO2 that you could cut would cost you almost nothing. It's very likely, you know, it's the out, outdoor heater uh, that's on when you're not there. Right. It would just stop that. It costs you nothing and you've just saved a little bit of climate change. You probably shouldn't get the last ton of CO2 either because that's the one that keeps your baby surviving kind of thing. Right. So it's somewhere in between, you know, where the costs get higher and the benefits get lower, that's where you should, that's the balancing point. That's what he spent his career on. That's what Richard Tall and many others have spent their careers on. They all universally find you should cut some, but not too much CO2. We're not cutting enough. We're cutting it probably also the wrong places. We're cutting too much in the rich world, too little in the developing world, that kind of thing. But fundamentally, that's the equilibrium argument. And because he makes that very simple argument, which I think is absolutely impossible to fundamentally disagree with, he's getting pilloried because it's obviously uh, not convenient for a lot of people who have said two degrees or 1.5 degrees, which is very clearly incredibly ineffective. It's basically saying, yes, let's cut all the way to the last ton of CO2, almost the last ton of CO2, which you know, no sane economist would say is a smart uh, solution. Sure. Just one quick thing about Nordhaus. One of the, the studies that I thought was uh, most interesting, and it wasn't the one he won the Nobel for, but it was comparing nighttime luminosity with, uh, with income levels, right? Just measuring yes. the light coming yep. from the earth and the brighter the city, the, the higher the income, which, you know, when you think, well, of course, but no, they took, they took satellite data and actually uh, matched it yeah. with, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with income data. So I've asked you. you let, let, sorry, I, I've Go also ahead. got it. My other favorite from Nordhaus, which is also not about climate, uh, was his study on uh, how much do we get the inflation correction wrong? Uh, because obviously, you know, it's very, very hard to adjust for inflation because most things also become qualitatively better. And how do you adjust for that? So if you just look at the, the same level output, but don't adjust for quality, you actually underestimate the amount of progress we've done over the world because you inflate inflation adjust too much. So what he did was he said, let's take a look at lighting since back from uh, Babylonian oh, right, yeah, times. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and because lighting has this wonderful quality, you know, it's fundamentally one thing you want, you want more light and we can measure that. And you can then look at what's the price and how much light do you get? And what he found was all the way from Babylonian lamps to uh, uh, LED lamps today was that we vastly underestimated the benefit and the social 
progress that we've gotten. Uh, you know, if you measure it in terms of how much time do you have to work in order to get one candle right. equivalent. The amount of labor, the amount turns of lumen, out, yeah, amount of labor it, per lumen, I guess. It was, uh, yes, yeah, it turns yeah. out that you have much, much more. And so one of his arguments was we probably over uh, uh, inflation adjusting or we're under appreciating how much better the world is than what it used to be. So, you know, we've got about uh, 20,000 times more light over the last 200 years or so. Uh, and it's just as outstanding. You know, most people 200 years ago had a little bit of candlelight for a very brief time. So, you know, sort of 15 minutes or thereabouts. Today, you have light everywhere all the time you want. How much of a difference has that made? Well, it means yeah. we can live for you know, the whole 24 hours and we can just go to sleep for eight hours, except you know, back, back then we, you know, you'd sleep most of the night and you'd you know, be up, but in total darkness, typically. Right. And, um, so much, and so much light that there, we have a problem with light pollution, right? For astronomy yes. and, and, and the rest of it. There's always something to be worried about. <laughs> Okay, so last thing, uh, and my guest Bjorn Lomborg, uh, the president of the Copenhagen Consensus, CopenhagenConsensus.com. Uh, his new book is False Alarm. Um, so what gives you hope? Um, your, your book, I think, ultimately is one that's very pro-human, which is one of the reasons I like it, um, because I think the humanism angle is, is lost amidst a lot of this policy, right? Um, and that ultimately, this is about people. What gives you hope? Well, fundamentally, the, the world is going to be a much better place in 2100. Whether I get, you know, I, my arguments win or they lose terribly, simply because that's the trajectory of, of human uh, uh, opportunity. We're simply going to in innovate a lot of these things that will make our lives easier, they'll feed our kids better, they'll make us not die from a lot of infectious diseases. All these things will happen. We will probably also be have solved climate change by the end of the century. We might have solved it the incredibly expensive and bad way. We might have solved it the really smart way with innovation. But either way, we'll probably have solved most of that as well, because we'll be so rich that we can afford even the dumb way. So the, the, the fundamental point, my arc, what I'm trying is not to try to get us to pick a path where we all become, the world becomes great. But if we don't listen to me, the world will be terrible. My point is really, do we want the really wonderful world or the slightly less wonderful world? And that's a pretty good outcome to worry about, right? Uh, so, so that's why, you know, I, I have great hope that most of the things that we worry about today, we will not be worrying about in a hundred years, simply because we will have been, you know, we'll fix most of those problems. Think back a hundred years, what we worried about, what were the things that were concerns? It doesn't mean the world is going to be without trouble. And it doesn't mean that there's not, you know, some really big concerns like, you know, uh, bioterrorism, for instance, those kinds of things. I think there are some things that, you know, we could be generally worried about. So we talked about uh, AI. If I, I'm not well enough uh, you know, read up on this to really know whether we should worry about it. But, you know, smart people that I admire tell us that we should probably be concerned about that. There are some things that we should be definitely concerned about. We should certainly also be concerned about global warming. You know, like one of the many things that we should be, uh, uh, be, be concerned about. But fundamentally, I think we're going to find it really hard to screw it up. <laughs> I like that. I like it's a great way to end right there. Anything that I've missed, Bjorn, uh, that uh, we, sh we should cover here before we sign off? So just very briefly, what we do uh, on, with the Copenhagen Consensus is really just look at across all the different areas uh, of, of human endeavor and say, where can you spend a dollar and do the most good? And what we find is typically all the stuff that nobody really cares about because it's mostly in developing countries. It's mostly about getting nutrition to small kids. That's not, it turns out that's not only an incredibly morally good thing, you know, kids shouldn't be starving. But it also means if you get food to small kids, their brains develop more. So when they go to school, even if it's a crappy school, which it probably is, they will learn more and they'll become much more productive and hence increase their growth rate of their countries when they become adults. And, you know, likewise, free trade, uh, 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 contraception, uh, uh, deal with uh, infectious diseases. So, you know, uh, ensure uh, 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 that, that kids get, uh, get uh, inoculated, that you tackle uh, tuberculosis, malaria, also HIV, that you get better education initiatives. That's very much about uh, 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 streamlining schools. So instead of having all the six-year-olds and all the 12-year-olds in the same grade, have all the ones with the same abilities 
in the same grade because that teaches kids a lot more. Very, very simple things that very little that would just make the world a lot better. Now, this is what we mostly do. So we do this for Ghana and other uh, governments in, in, in Africa and Asia. Uh, but of course, nobody in the rich world care about that. We care about, you know, global warming or plastic pollution or all these other things that are fashionable. And in one way, it's a really good outcome because it means we're rich. You know, we don't worry about the fact that our kids are going to die from easily curable infectious diseases because we fix that. So, so what, we sp uh, what I spend most of my time on is actually nothing of the stuff that we've talked about. It's on all these other very, very simple things that we really should be focused a lot more on. One of the reasons why we're not is because we're so overworried about some other things that we hear so much about. And one of them is probably global warming, where people think the end of the world. No, it's a problem. It's one problem among many. We are only going to fix this and all the other problems if we think about them in the right scale. That's a good summary. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, my guest, Bjorn Lomborg, his new book is False Alarm. It's available pretty much everywhere. Uh, climate change panic costs us trillions, hurts the poor, and fails to fix the planet. Dr. Lomborg, many thanks to you for being on the Power Hungry podcast. Uh, for you all, of, all of you out there in podcast land, you can uh, uh, rate this if you listen to us. Give us a good rating on your, your favorite platform. And uh, uh, please tune in for the next episode of the Power Hungry podcast. Thanks again. Thanks a lot, Robert.